But in all of my 72 years, I personally had never actually seen a live sperm whale out in the ocean. They live too far out. Uh, I'd uh, filmed and seen uh, 18 other different species of whales and dolphins. But I couldn't go to the Azores or the Galapagos or Sri Lanka where sperm whales have been studied. I learned about a special three-day and three-night trip out of uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts, 100 miles out in the Atlantic Ocean to the edge of the continental shelf where sperm whales had been sighted on previous trips. The point of departure for this special whale watch trip was Gloucester, Massachusetts, home of the Yankee fleet. On the afternoon of Thursday, July 4th, the voyagers assembled at the Cape Ann Marina, where the seagulls gave us a raucous welcome. Participants in this three-day and three-night excursion came from as far away as California. We gathered with our luggage in an open courtyard near the dock where there was an explanatory display about sperm whales. A number of the passengers were old friends who had been on previous whale watching trips sponsored by seafarers expeditions operated by trip leader Scott Marion from Bangor, Maine. The chief naturalist aboard was also named Scott, Scott Krauss from the New England Aquarium in Boston. It was exciting to think about going 100 miles out into the Atlantic Ocean and spending two days and nights there looking for deep sea whales. I was interested in a map showing the route that we would be taking, heading southeast from Gloucester and Cape Ann, going past Cape Cod and down through the Great South Channel to the edge of the Continental Shelf, as shown here by Tyler Seavey. The ship we were going on, out on was the Yankee Freedom, a fully equipped 100-foot vessel designed for this kind of ocean expedition. There were a total of 34 persons aboard, including the two trip leaders and a crew of six. There was a large roomy lounge and dining cabin on the main deck. As the boat left the dock in the dark, with night lights glowing around us, and we headed out of the harbor into the ocean that first evening, we felt a sense of peace and of growing anticipation. In the cabin before bedtime, the naturalists showed us pictures of the various kinds of cetaceans we were likely to see on this trip. This painting by Richard Ellis shows in proportionate size 17 species of whales and dolphins found in the waters off the North American continent. The species that we did see included the familiar bottlenose dolphin, the kind most often captured and displayed in aquariums, found all along the Atlantic coast, and the colorful common dolphin, which usually travels in large groups and loves swimming in bow waves. The most frequently seen large whale in the North Atlantic is the humpback whale, with its long white flippers and gracefully tipped tail. This is a Risso's dolphin, somewhat larger and whiter in color, and with a tall dorsal fin. We also caught a glimpse of a pod of small, fast-swimming, Atlantic white-sided dolphins early one morning. The largest whale commonly seen off Cape Cod is the fin whale, which has a white underside and can grow to be 80 feet, second only to the blue whale. Pilot whales, almost entirely black, grow to 18 feet and have rounded dorsal fins, traveling often in large groups. And finally, we come to the great sperm whale, which generally is found only far out in deep waters beyond the continental shelf. There was one other species of whale which the naturalist told us about, too rare to be included in this painting. It was the North Atlantic beaked whale, shown here in a drawing by Connecticut artist Donald Sinetti, sighting and filming this almost never seen whale turned out to be the most exciting and dramatic part of our entire trip. The weather was sunny but windy, and the sea was quite rough. In the narrow bunks below, most of us were eager to be out on deck, trying to get used to the roll of the waves. We spent most of the morning lining the rails, looking for whales. <laughs> 